Hey, fellow Mathers, before we get into this episode, we want to share with you how you can get access to free content, professional learning that will keep your students engaged and doing the math that matters. Get ready to go to this link, mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. That's right. Registration is open for the free Math is Figure Outable challenge that's starting May 15th and runs to the 17th at 7 p.m. Central. We're going to have three nights jam-packed with learning and routines that you can take straight to your classroom. In these challenges, we have a great time. We do some math, talk about classroom experiences, give away super cool bonuses and prizes. You won't just walk away with routines that are naturally engaging and encourage your students to think mathematically. You'll also have a chance to win over 6 k worth in prizes, including a few virtual PD sessions for your school. I'll be joined by my wonderful co-host, Kim, and special guest, Jenna Laib. You can register at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge for a fantastic learning experience. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Now on to the show. Hey, fellow mathematicians. Welcome to the podcast where math is figureoutable. I'm Pam. And I'm Kim. And you found a place where math is not about memorizing and mimicking, waiting to be told or shown what to do. But y'all, it's about making sense of problems, noticing patterns, and reasoning using mathematical relationships. We can mentor students to think and reason like mathematicians. Not only are algorithms not really particularly helpful in teaching mathematics, but rotely repeating steps actually keep students from being the mathematicians they can be. Today, we're going to be wrapping up our series on the area model and taking it a bit higher grade-wise as we examine how the area model impacts middle and high school. Yeah, so area model, middle, high school, let's keep going. So first of all, teachers of younger students, please use the area model well. Check out the last two episodes. Please use it well because then we can take that and do marvelous things with it higher on, uh, uh, higher up, higher grades. One of the things is that because the chunking of the areas on an area model is based on the distributive property, we are for sure going to use that in higher math. And so we really want to have that good basis with area so that we can take that intuition and we can build on it. One way we can do that um, is at the middle school level where we have things like Um, fractions and decimals, and we can help students kind of reason, build spatial reasoning with, say, fraction multiplication. So for example, if I were to give some kind of mm, lovely problem like two and a half, so two and one half times one and two fifths, if that was the problem that we're going to deal with, when I originally, initially begin to start working with students with that problem, um, I would want to build some chunks of areas. I would want to use the area model to build intuition. So I might say, hey, students, what what would that look like? What are you thinking about when you see two and a half times one and two fifths? And so we might draw, I'm drawing on my paper right now, something that's two long and then a half long by something that's one long and then two fifths long. Like that's sort of a estimate there about how long that would be. And do we, could we, could we uh, recognize that as an area that is two and a half by one and two fifths. And so I might, I might represent that. And then I might say, what are some chunks, you know, and early on, as we're making sense of above fraction multiplication, I would expect students to cut that into, um, that two and a half by one and two fifths, uh, into probably four chunks where they might say, okay, I've got uh, a two, I I cut the two and a half into two and one half, and I would cut the one and two fifths into one and two fifths fifths. And that's going to end up with kind of, it's going to be similar to what a partial product might look like. A partial place value, partial product model might look like in um, whole numbers where I've kind of have these four chunks I'm dealing with. And one of the chunks is that two by one chunk. So the area of a two by one is two. So I've got a two by one and in the middle of that, I've got two. I've also got a chunk that is that half by one and so I'm thinking now, students are going to have to think here. What is the area of something that is uh, has a dimension of one half by one? And I want students to actually have to think about that. Like, can they think about a, a one by one and then cut it in half to get a half by one? Like, there's lots of different, I, I want students to grapple with that relationship, that the area of a, a rectangle that's one half by one is indeed one half. Then I want them to grapple with this other chunk over there that would be two by two fifths, 
what does it mean to have an, a rectangle that's two by two fifths? Is that four fifths? Like what is twice two fifths? Is that four fifths? And then I have this little tiny uh, square in the bottom or rectangle in the bottom that would be one half by two fifths. And I'm, I'm looking at my, my drawing. It's not too, the scale's not too, too bad. Uh, but a one half by two fifths, what in the world? Now we have students have really have to think about what the area of a one half of two fifths is. But I also want students thinking about a half of two fifths. Could they think about one by two fifths to cut it in half to get a half, one half by two fifths? So is the area of a one half by two fifths just half of two fifths? Is that like one fifth? So now in this rectangle, I've got four chunks of area and they're not square, by the way. Maybe I should have said that. This is not two and a half by one and two fifths is not square. It's rectangular. It's, it's longer than it is wide. Then I've got these rectangles in there that I'm going to add up. So I've got a two and I've got, a, got an area of two, an area of one half, an area of four fifths, and an area of one fifth. Well, now I want to strategically add those together because I don't know if you caught that, especially if you're listening as you're driving in the car. Y'all grab a pencil as we're doing this. Now I've got a, a rectangle that is four fifths, a, an area of four fifths, and I've got a rectangle that is an area of one fifth. Well, what's four fifths and one fifth? Is that just five fifths? Bam. So there's, there's an area of one. Then I've also got that area of two. So that's three so far, plus that extra half. And so we end up with three and a half as the area. Now, not all problems will end up where the area chunks so nicely, but I want to, um, I think, choose some strategic fraction multiplication problems and help really build that sense of spatial understanding yeah. of what's actually happening with the problem. Yeah. 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 Um, it's really nice because I think you can, as teachers, we don't, we're not bound by certain numbers, right? Like we don't have <laughs> to throw the ugliest ones out front. So I love this problem because the chunks that you would see students maybe do place value chunks with then mm. doesn't leave them with horrible addition at the end. And you're, you're relieving them from that struggle at the end to really think about the area. Yeah. To focus on the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's a big paradigm shift. I think for many math teachers is I was sort of raised with this idea that we have to make sure that they, they have this general procedure because you better do it with these easier numbers now, because you're going to need it for the harder numbers later. When in reality, it's not about easy and hard. It's about building students' brains to be able to reason mm -hmm. so that then they could judiciously choose what to do. Um, it's, right. it's such a different uh, paradigm perspective. So yeah. what could students do if they were looking at that two and a half by one and two fifths, if they don't just chunk it into those crazy pieces? We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but if you've listened to the episode from last week, could you double in half? And I'm actually going to do that. We're going to leave this to the readers. You know, that, that line in textbooks used to say, the proof is, is left to the reader. So listeners, I would challenge you to take two and a half times one and two fifths, draw the array, and then think about doubling and halving and see what you do with that. See if you can find yeah. maybe um, yeah. some nicer chunks to, to deal with. But Kim, I have a feeling that if I gave you two and a half times one and two fifths, you would abandon <laughs> fractions. Am I right on that? I would. would I would. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yeah, I would. So um, two and a half and one and two fifths. So two uh -huh. and a half is just 2.5 mm -hmm. for me. And then one and two fifths is one and four tenths, 1.4. Uh -huh. uh -huh. So then, so then I would, I would go double half, but I would start with 2.5 times 1.4. And then I would double half to get five times seven tenths or 70 cents. Mm, nice, 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 and then nice. And I get the same 350. Boom. So pretty slick. Oh, Part I of 350 because money, 3.5, excuse me. For oh, that's funny because I, I wrote down 3.50 because you said <laughs> 350. <laughs> nice. So y'all, one of our points is we do uh, believe that it is a great use of the area model to help students make sense of fraction multiplication, but yeah. then we don't necessarily want to get stuck there. Uh, yep. We uh, let's make sense of what's happening. We want students to, to make sense of the chunks, but then we quickly want to go, Hey, but let's chunk those chunks. Let's group those groups and let's use the strategies that we've developed for whole numbers. Can you double in half? Well, let's see, uh, maybe yeah. not. Could you, could you go a little over? Well, let's check that out. Could we find three times one and two fifths and then just take off a half of one and two fifths? Like, I mean, half of one and two fifths y'all half of one, half of two fifths, a little, little, little thing you might think about there. So again, we might um, help students use the area model, use open arrays, 
to chunk those chunks, group those groups in ways that are clever and efficient and they're making sense of area. They're building their spatial reasoning. They're building the sense of the distributed property. And uh, But then don't get stuck in it. We don't want uh, students to get stuck in the model. We want to then right. use everything else we know to solve things um, as efficient and clever as we can. Cool. Right. Can I interrupt for just a second? Because yeah, I yeah. know we're talking about the area model. I think this is where sometimes this particular model gets a bad rap because the message that sometimes parents are hearing is your child must draw an area model for every problem. And sometimes kids are like, uh, not for that problem. Or <laughs> that's not a, that's not a four chunk, two chunk, what, like whatever I'm thinking about. So now I have to draw this thing. And so the area model should be a tool. And if we're just forcing kids to go back and sketch it out after they're already thinking about it, after they're already solved it, then it's, we're kind of missing the point a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's sort of um, uh, effort that we that it doesn't need to be expended. There, I'm sure there's a better mm-hmm. way to say that. We don't want to force kids to do stuff they don't need. That's not going to be helpful. And so, yeah, we would encourage you to look at um, uh, if you're ever saying, show your work. And you're like, okay, yes, I want to see what's happening in your brain. But to force kids to draw, especially if you're forcing them to draw the place value partial products all the time for every problem. I, that that's not like, let's have a purpose and let's make yeah. sure that it's a helpful purpose. Um, yeah. Right. Nicely said. I, I do agree with you. That is one place where we're miss missing the boat a little bit and, and, and wreaking, um, not wreaking havoc, but causing havoc, like inviting, inviting um, controversy when we don't need it. Uh, it's, yeah. Cause it's not particularly helpful to force kids. And in fact, uh, let me just be clear when I'm using an area model, often when I'm uh, using it in class, often it's, it's, myself, I am actually representing as the teacher, I'm representing student mm-hmm. thinking. Um, we'll do plenty of problem strings where the students aren't drawing anything at all. Mm-hmm. But, but as they say the relationship they're thinking about, we are making that relationship visible right. Right. so that then we can point at it and talk about it, but we're not actually um, forcing students to draw at all. We will sometimes say to students, especially when we're doing area, we might say, you know, like area, we're really focused on area. Like what would that look like? But, uh, but we're not going to get stuck in it. Is that a way to say that? Cool. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. All right. Now, as we move from uh, thinking about um, kind of middle school um, fractions, decimals, and, and using an area model or an open array, we are definitely going to continue to build things on that basis. Area happens a lot in calculus. I mean, in mm-hmm. calculus, we find the area under a curve. We can use that to find integration rates based on area. There's lots of things. I mean, just the definition of a derivative, um, Riemann sums and everything. Like we often model that with area. So as we think about a reason to use area models in the younger grades, we absolutely want to develop a sense of area. What what we don't want is for kids to go area, perimeter. Mm, let's see, one of them you add, one of them you multiply. Which one's this? That's not a... That, we want to develop a far more robust sense of what it means to measure linearly and what it means to measure that sort of two-dimensional square unit, that span. And so that's super, super important. But then we're going to kind of rely on that intuition a little bit to help motivate us using what I'm not, I'm not going to now call an area model, what is going to become a bit more of a graphic organizer to do some other things. So there is a distinction between an area model and an array and a graphic organizer. And we can use them at different times to do different things. So let's just get some some clarity on where we can use the understanding that we build in the younger grades, the intuition and the, the real sense, the spatial reasoning that we build using an area model and an open array can then help us do some things with like polynomial multiplication. Um, Mm -hmm. what's it? Yeah. Woo. Just got higher math. So with polynomials, if I'm looking at something like, um, X minus three times X plus two, sometimes people will say, oh, I'm going to use an area model to do that. Well, let's be clear. As soon as we've got negatives involved, we're really not measuring anymore. Uh, we don't really have negative lengths. We don't have negative area. That would be kind of like what a black hole or I don't know, antimatter. I mean, that's <laughs> I, <laughs> may, maybe off in space somewhere. But what, as soon as we have negative numbers, we're not really having positive measurement anymore. But we can use the sense that we've sort of built 
to, about the distributed property and about kind of what uh, that how that how we could take an area model and turn it into a graphic organizer to do things like I could say, well, if I if I'm thinking about the product of x minus three times x plus two, then I could say I could kind of draw a graphic organizer, and now I am drawing a square, and I'm putting x on the left hand side, and then negative three uh, sort of below that. And then across the top, I'm putting X and then positive two. And I am splitting that into four equal chunks. And I'm using this graphic organizer of the square cut into four equal chunks to help me think about the distributed property, to help me make sure I don't miss any parts. And I can think about X times X, and that gives me uh, X squared, a product of X squared. And then I have that negative three times X, and that gives me a product of negative three X. And then I've got X times two, and I'm filling in the pieces of this graphic organizer, x times two is two x. And then that final square in the graphic organizer, negative three times two is negative six. And then I could gather all those terms together. So I had an x yep. squared, a two x, a negative three x, and a negative six. When I gather those together, I've got x squared, the negative three x, and the two x is negative x and negative one x. And then I've got that negative six or minus six. So in other words, the product of the quantity x minus three times the quantity x plus two is x squared minus x minus six. And I can help find that. I can help keep track of the distributive property using something that kind of resembles the area model that we built this intuition around with rectangles and area yeah. with whole numbers and fractions and decimals. And now I'm going to kind of use that intuition to help me make sense of the distributed property with these variables in polynomial multiplication. You're speaking my language, Pam, because that's Damn. exactly what um, Cooper is <laughs> starting to work on. Are you serious? And so, yeah. And so he is just kind of, there's no models, right? And so when we started- Well, that's unfortunate. That. That's unfortunate. We, well, we're, not liking, well, yeah. we're not liking there's no models. Okay, keep going. So I will sketch, oh, it's like this. And he looks at me and he's like, uh, okay. And, and it's <laughs> connecting to stuff that he's done before, which is really cool, you know? Yeah. And that's the big point. So you, yeah. when we say, know your content, know your kids, you obviously know your kid and you know the content. And so you're looking at this higher math that he's doing and you're like, oh dude, we can base this on what we built before. Like, check yep. it out. This is, remember this thing we've done before? Look how this relates to that. And that is exactly the point. So yep. uh, middle school, high school teachers, um, I'm recommending that you don't call that graphic organizer an area model because it's not, it's not right representing mm-hmm. area, but mm-hmm. it is representing the product of two factors. Just like we earlier, we used the area model to represent the, the product of the two dimensions of factors that were representing dimensions and area we can sort of use that. Similarly, we can use the same kind of thing to think about polynomial division. Mm -hmm. There's actually a paper out there somewhere that says students must learn long division with whole numbers because we're going to need it for polynomial long division, to which I say, nope, no, we do not. We can absolutely use that same graphic organizer to reason about polynomial division and have far less opportunity for error because you don't have that crazy subtracting negatives that happens if, and I know I'm talking straight to high school teachers right now, but high school teachers, you know, when you do polynomial long division, that once you've got that, that second row on there, and now you've got to subtract, you've got all these negatives floating around and you're subtracting negatives. And I've heard you say to students, just, just put a plus sign and then change all the signs. And I like, (laughs) ah, I mean, that is a way to get correct answers, but not a lot of reasoning happening there. So when students are doing polynomial long division, If you've done polynomial multiplication in that graphic organizer, you'll start to notice some patterns like the um, like terms are are happening in the diagonals. And if you notice that uh, the diagonals are having where the when you're collecting like terms, those are happening in the diagonals. When you undo that, then you can just reason about what you need based on the part of the diagonal you have needs to add to that term. And I know I'm talking kind of all crazy. We'll, we'll do a whole podcast episode on polynomial long division at some point. But for today, I just want to note that if we use the area model well for whole numbers and decimals, then we can build into polynomial multiplication and polynomial division. I'm in fact, I just want to, Oh, keep go going. Ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll finish. Well, was, and then don't, don't, okay. don't forget. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. The high school teachers, the, the problem strings I've written in the uh, advanced algebra problem string book, actually has you start with thinking about uh, an area model with whole numbers into a graphic organizer with multiplying 
uh, polynomials into a graphic organizer within dividing polynomials. Okay, Kim, go. Yeah. Well, I just want to I want to give a <laughs> shout out to my my kids' former teachers um, because Luke recently was watching a, a video about long division, and I kind of walked up and I was like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and he said, "Oh, um, I this was the video for today in math." And so I said, "Why? What? What?" And he said, well, we're about to start doing this other thing and we needed to review long division first before we could do this new thing. And I was like, okay. And, and Luke's never, never done long division. With whole numbers. With whole numbers. Right. So he's, Mm -hmm. he's always just kind of stayed under the radar and never done it. And so. Meaning, sorry, let me just be clear. He's always reasoned through division. He hasn't yes. done a series of steps that he memorized under a house track to do long division. Correct. Okay, keep, keep going. Correct. Uh-huh. Correct. And so anyway, he, when he showed me a problem, uh, the polynomial division problem, and I said, oh, th- this is a division problem. So that's kind of like, we know one of the factors and I said area because I didn't know what else to say. So now I'll do better. But I said, that's kind of, and I said, it, it's not really area, but it's kind of like, here's the product of that. So all you're trying to figure out is the other dimension. And he was like, oh, that's it? I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he it. goes on yeah. his merry way to just figure out. And, um, you know, it's it's brilliant because he has a picture in his mind of the way you consider the two factors and the product. And the inverse of that is just, what if I know one of the dimensions, then. And uh, and you know the product. Yeah. Yeah. Then you can, then you can find out, find the other factor. Ah, that's brilliant. Way to go, Luke. You know, you're reminding me of a story when my second um, was taking either second or third semester calculus. So my number two was at university and he's taking either second or third semester calculus. I can't remember which one. And he said, Hey mom, I did your thing. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, I did your thing today in calculus. And I was like, Oh dude, send me a picture. And he sent me a picture of, of, of a full page because, you know, calculus problems kind of take a bit of work, right? So there's one problem, took the full page, and he circled this little bit on the top. Because as part of this this entire huge calculus problem, part of what he had to do was a little bit of polynomial division. And he yeah. had, literally, he had kind of that graphic organizer, looks like an area model kind of thing. And he had just a little bit. Like, he didn't even fill it all out. Because once he had put enough in it, then he just moved what he knew was going to happen to the part he needed for the rest of the calculus problem. Yep. And he kind of put a little smiley face next to that little part. And it was, it was anyway. So yeah, because we can just use what we know to solve yeah. problems more and more advanced if we actually own it and we actually are yeah. using relationships to solve problems. And I'll just mention as a last here, uh, application for higher math, that if we've got students really reasoning using this graphic organizer, then we can kind of bring back area a little bit, at least the sense of area and have a super nice way of completing the square. And so completing the square is a thing that we do. And I think the best reason to complete the square is to be able to find uh, the centers of conics that if we have a conic section and we're trying to like find the center of a circle or or of a hyperbola or an ellipse, then it's, it can be really helpful to complete the square so that we can tell where the the vertex is going to be or the center is going to be. And that's a super nice, uh, by the way, I'll just say it out loud. I don't really like completing the square for solving equations. I know someone's going to be like, not happy about that, but I don't think it's a great time. I don't think it's a great time to bring in that. uh, I, I I don't think we need it for solving equations. But I do think it's a fine thing that we can build. We can actually understand what's happening, completing the square, if we use this uh, sense and understanding from an area model into the graphic organizer. We can literally help complete the square graphically, yeah. physically, spatially, um, and it's a super nice way. So yeah. we like the area model. It's so cool, right? So teachers of younger grades, I'm talking to you here, let's use it really well in our grades so that these teachers of older students can build on that intuition to do all of these really cool higher math things. Absolutely. All right, y'all. Thanks for tuning in and teaching more and more real math. To find out more about the Math is Figure Outable movement, visit mathisfigureoutable.com. Let's keep spreading the word that math is figure outable. Thank you for listening and making math more figure outable. To learn even more, make sure you register for our free challenge at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. You are not going to want to miss the evenings of May 15th through 17th, starting at 7 p.m. Central.
math teaching, math teaching, go register now. That's mathisforgottable.com slash challenge. Join us to make math more and more figure outable. And if you can't join live, register and we'll send you access to the recordings. We'll see you there.